So without further ado, I'd like you to welcome um, our, to the February Arizona Archaeological Historical Society lecture series, uh, Dr. Ben Bellarado, who is the Assistant Curator of Archaeology at the Arizona State Museum, University of Arizona. For over 25 years, Dr. Bellarado has conducted research as an anthropological archaeologist specialized specializing in studying the ancient cultures of the Four Corners area in the U.S. Southwest. His interests include textile analysis, ceramic and rock art studies, tribal collaboration and ethnography, cross-media stylistic analysis, and dendroarchaeology dendro in the northern U.S. Southwest. His work focuses on understanding the ways that ancient cultures interacted with the social and natural worlds and how identities are expressed through clothing and other decorative media. Through collaborative research with descended communities, archaeological fieldwork, and collections-based research, Dr. Bellarado uses archaeological methods to reinforce and strengthen indigenous ties to landscapes and advocates for preserving cultural resources in the Bears Ear, Ear, Ears National Monument and across the northern U.S. Southwest. Please welcome Dr. Ben Bellarado. All right, well, good evening. Thank you very much uh, for coming this evening and Welcome to everybody out there in uh, internet land as well. Um, so before I get started this evening, I want to um, acknowledge uh, the indigenous people and um, their land uh, who I'll be talking about this evening. So the artifacts and the sites that I'll be talking about uh, recovered and um, are, are situated in the traditional homelands of clans and uh, groups ancestors of the Hopi, the Zuni, the Acma, uh, Laguna and numerous Rio Grande River Pueblos, as well as clans of the Diné or Navajo and, and Apache, and bands of the Ute and Paiute peoples. <clears throat> now, the artifacts and the sites I investigated in this research are very fragile, and they're often uh, from threatened places. So I encourage you all, and I know I'm speaking to a friendly audience here, but please help us to protect cultural resources, both in the Southwest and beyond. And just as a note, um, none of the objects that I will be showing this evening uh, come from burial context. So you can put your mind at ease that way. So this evening, I'm going to be talking about a bunch of things. Um, this is a, a general list of it. I'm going to be talking about recent research on Chaco, um, recent research on the road system that articulates with Chaco Canyon. And then I'm also going to propose an alternative approach to looking at roads that I'm going to be following and talk about the theoretical approaches I use as an anthropological archaeologist. Um, and then I'll be talking about footwear and footwear imagery. It's really my bread and butter and the thing that gets me most excited. Um, and also then the way that those things articulate with social identities of, um, and sandal wares and how um, sandal wares negotiated their identities along roads. So to give you all a background, I know many of you probably are pretty familiar with the Chaco uh, regional system, um, but the Chaco era started in the northern southwest about 850 and extends to about 1140 AD. Now this is um, uh, the first time we see a big regional-wide uh, system of connected settlements that spreads throughout the Four Corners area. Uh, we see uh, the Chaco Canyon here at the center of this big system um, and Pueblo Benito at its heart are really the center. It's the center of this Chaco world. Uh, this is the first time we see really clear and widespread development of regional, or sorry, of social hierarchies, and also the exchange of, of goods, both mundane and exotic, across this big uh, region. We also see the development of massive monumental architecture, great houses. And this is Pueblo Benito, the largest of the great houses uh, at the center of Chaco Canyon. <clears throat> We also see uh, in the center here, great kivas. And then of course, these linear things articulating with Chaco are the Chacoan roads. Uh, between 1030 and 1140, we also see the development of Chaco outliers is what we call them. Basically smaller versions of Pueblo Benito um, placed and situated along across this big, uh, large basin. <clears throat> Now, uh, the Chaco era seems to end right about 1140, uh, co co excuse me, coinciding with a severe region-wide drought. Uh, at this point, we see a reorganization of the Chaco world. Some folks have called it a collapse, but um, it's really more of a, a retooling, a reorganization. Um, and 
at that point in time, we see that the center of the new region, uh, the new regional system, uh, shifts to the north along the San Juan and Animas Rivers area, what we call the Tota or Middle San Juan, um, and with the, the construction and enlargement of the Aztec West complex. Uh, this becomes the new center of regional interaction. At the same time, we see a revitalization of many Chacoan uh, rituals and performance spaces and the development of new traditions and artifacts. Uh, and at the same time, we also see increased territoriality. Um, it's a smaller system than it had been. We don't see as much uh, exchange coming in and out of different portions of the region. Then starting about 1200, we see what we call the Mesa Verde period, where there's a major shift towards canyon head settlements um, and cliff dwellings, like you might've seen at Mesa Verde National Park. Sand Canyon is uh, right at the head of a um, large canyon system. It's pretty uh, uh, great example of the type of settlements we see. Um, and then uh, between 1250 and the 1290s, uh, the, this Four Corners area becomes depopulated. Ancestral Pueblo people move out of the area and move to places like Hopi, Zuni, uh, Laguna, and they're along the Rio Grande. <clears throat> so um, then recent research on roads, and I should say there's a vast literature on Chaco and roads and the road system. Um, but this is just some of the most uh, common interpretations about road function. So this is a recent map from um, uh, Feynman, Sofer, and Weiner. And you can see some of the major road systems as we know them across the big basin, uh, particularly with uh, these large roads coming right into Chaco Canyon. Um, so some of the most uh, common types of interpretations is that, of course, that roads facilitate the movement of people, people walking up and down these between uh, community centers. Uh, with those people, uh, the interpretation is also that there's a lot of economic movement of goods, so pottery, wood, um, particularly wood from the Chuska Mountains, uh, very fancy type of lithic material, particularly Narbona Pass Chert from the Chuska Mountains, uh, but also turquoise, and then foodstuffs, and then many other types of goods. Um, Chaco has been called a sink of materials. Things seem to come in, they don't really push out that often. <clears throat> um, there's also interpretations that roads were linked um, a function to lead community centers, uh, both symbolically in terms of maintaining and developing alliances, but then also um, connecting with ancestral sites. Many roads go from one settlement that was currently occupied to an older settlement that is no longer occupied. These are what uh, have been termed time bridges or ritual umbilicals, connecting with ancestors in the past. One of the more common uh, interpretations of Chaco and Rhodes is centers around pilgrimages, um, and specifically pilgrimages to Chaco Canyon or other large uh, civic ceremonial centers at these great houses. Um, and then also there's interpretations that Rhodes conceptually align uh, both uh, people, settlements, and systems with important directions, with important landscape features, um, and then also with uh, astronomical alignment. So uh, solar um, uh, uh, solstices, equinoxes, and lunar standstills. And these are just um, uh, some of the more common interpretations. Now, most recent Chaco and research, sorry, uh, Chaco Road research focuses on identifying linear features um, in uh, sediment, basically uh, dirt covered landscapes. <laughs> and currently, there's several studies using LIDAR, um, uh, which is a pretty uh, sophisticated um, set of techniques, either uh, drone mounted or aerial ve vehicle mounted, um, and work by Friedman et al. Um, Sean Field and Kelsey Reese um, uh, in the, the Colorado area, sorry, Freeman and all are working really in the central San Juan Basin. And then Hearst, uh, Till and Winch, who are good friends of mine, are working in southeastern Utah, but using very similar techniques where it's uh, basically um, <clears throat> flying over landscapes using LIDAR to penetrate through vegetation to look at, uh, to find alignments. And these alignments are often discontinuous. You can see in this figure here, uh, from Friedman et al, how these inter, uh, interstitial spaces really can't find any road segments, but uh, where there's intact sediments, you can see these particular things. 
And you can see how different projections will help you pull those out. These are really difficult to see. Um, and recently I was uh, had the opportunity to, to uh, volunteer for my colleagues in Southeastern Utah, uh, particularly Jonathan Till here on the left has done uh, work on Chaco and roads uh, for a long time. And we've walked many, many roads together over the years. <clears throat> These are extremely difficult to see. So here you can see on the right, this is a picture of a road segment that Winston Hearst is walking through. Uh, basically we're ground to through thing, these alignments. Uh, I don't know if you can make it out, but this is where this alignment heads to. And you can see this particular one heads from one of the Chocolin uh, era great houses um, uh, on Cedar Mesa and runs directly north towards the Bears Ears Buttes. So often with these types of studies, uh, you have to do ground truthing. Basically you fly over an area with the LIDAR, uh, you get that projection, and then you'll have to go see if you can find it on the landscape. Often they're very, very difficult to see. Um, and some of the most common ways of ground truthing these studies is to um, basically document artifact scatters along the potential alignments. And so basically what you have to do is follow this potential alignment. Winston here has a, uh, uh, the the projection on his on his phone basically showing where the edge of the road was, um, and with the GPS, and we're walking perpendicular to this road. Um, the road goes this way. We're walking transects spaced about five to ten meters apart to try to find any artifacts and then distinguish those from the background noise on these long lived cultural landscapes. So here, this is the road projection, very, very difficult to see. And then we're walking this perpendicular here to try to find artifacts. Along this particular segment, we found um, uh, several of these are the most diagnostic sherds, uh, typical, pretty typical of the Chaco and early post Chaco eras. <clears throat> so in my research, um, I have not done that much work on actually uh, walking the landscape with LIDAR imagery. And instead, I take an alternative approach that I think really helps because it contextualizes road-related um, imagery through the study of footwear. And that might sound a little crazy at first, so I'll explain. Now, I want to point out that this doesn't refute any of the findings from previous research. I think that um, these, these studies I've outlined briefly are really, really incredible. And these folks are using um, the cutting edge uh, technology Technologies. And, um, but I think there's, there's places we can fill in some holes. And my shift really modifies the focus to looking at the places that are connected uh, by these road segments on, on uh, sediment. And it helps us to look at the materiality of using roads helps us to look at additional perspectives on the intent of Chaco Roads uh, construction and its use. Um, who was using roads? How did they use them? And what are some of the ways they were moved across? These are ways that can help us understand these roads in a slightly different way. <clears throat> so to talk about some of the theoretical approaches that I use as an anthropological archeologist, uh, we often try to front end our theory so you understand where we're coming from. And one of the most important places to do that is from the perspective of descendant communities. So um, footprints, um, uh, particularly sandal prints, sandal tracks, are a type of footprint that the Hopi perceive um, uh, along with all different, all of the different types of archeological materials as metaphorical footprints of their ancestors. So sites, pottery, trails, artifacts, clothing are all the marks and tracks of Hopi ancestors on their migrations. Uh, they represent, to quote uh, my friend Lyle Blanqua, the physical and spiritual connections to our past. Footprints are also used to claim land, to claim resources, um, and to connect with people and places and things, both living people, uh, people in the past, and non-human entities. And generally speaking, petroglyphs are known as tatuvani, or footprint marks, um, whether they're showing footprints or anything else. Um, and they're left as clan ancestors migrated across the Southwest. So to take that research a little bit further, I've been working with uh, two uh, master weavers um, from different Pueblo communities, Chris Lewis from the Pueblo of Zuni and Louis Garcia, who's of Piro and Tiwa descent, who lives in Albuquerque. And these are both really well-known and established weavers. Uh, they don't weave sandals. Nobody really weaves sandals professionally uh, full-time anymore, but they're very uh, adept at some of these same types of woven structures and materials that go that went into making sandals in the past. 
Um, so Louis had a great quote, I'll read you. So it says, from a Pueblo perspective, footwear would absorb uh, and take on aspects of the weaver spirit, becoming an integral part of individual and group identities. This helps to situate us and to think about how people thought about clothing of all types, but particularly about footwear. Now I'll come back to these guys a few times throughout the talk. So sandals in their images are really a special kind of uh, ancestral footprint because they contain this indelible and um, uh, biography, the story of their production, their use, their discard, um, that we can't find really in very many other ways. You know, somebody can make a pot and they can use a pot, but then they can trade a pot and you lose that individual in that transmission. With sandals, it's not really like that. These are things that belong to people, specific individuals and aren't traded or, or given away. Uh, so this really helps us to reconstruct the story of both the weaver's actions, so their skills and their interactions, but also um, with their movements and activities, uh, both of the wearer and of the weaver. Uh, and we can look at activities along routes of travel, and particularly roads. So this is just one way to understand roads um, and the past generally. So one of the other theoretical approaches I use is what we call cross-media approaches. Um, and these are used to help understand shared design systems and design content across different media. This allows us to compare content and structure between things like sandals and pots and murals and rock art. It allows us to understand the relative importance of certain things um, at different times and places. And it also really is important because it helps us to look at the context in which these things were used. So we're not just looking at the sandals, we're looking at how people chose to represent those particular objects in the places where they had the most salient social value. Uh, and with many types of theory, we have a, this sits on a spectrum. Basically, we recognize with cross-media approaches both pervasive and partitive design systems. So pervasive designs are used to decorate many types of things at once, um, whereas partitive designs are used to decorate only certain types of things but not others. So a great example, classic example, comes from the Southwest from the Bassmaker III period, where we have this, what we call Thunderbird design that shows up on pottery, but at the same time, it also shows up on other types of portable things like sandal treads and basketry and a few other things. So it's, it's shared between media. Now, regardless of the media it appears, basically we see this common uh, theme, basically something is speaking across these. We can see the me meaning migrating across domain boundaries. Um, now at the same time in the same culture, um, rock art actually has a very different type of design system being used, partitive. Uh, so we can see, um, in this example here, we have bighorn sheep being hunted uh, in these big willows or some type of plant, a flute player. And you can see that none of these design elements or motifs show up on these portable objects. That doesn't mean one was more, one system was more important than the other. They were both used at the same time with the same culture. And you can see just how things are parsed out in different times and places. Now, with sandals, in particular twine sandals, um, we see in the Chaco, post Chaco era, these show up in all sorts of different media. So we have the actual sandals themselves, both you can see this, the top of the sandal and then the raised tread designs on the bottom. Um, we have a, a beautiful uh, Puerto black on red bowl with uh, design, sandal designs painted inside of them. Uh, a, the stone we call sandal last. Um, this is two sides of a wooden sandal tablet that's painted. And then we also see mural decorations where we have a, uh, these mismatched pair of sandals and then uh, rock art examples as well. So the last theory uh, I'll tell you about is what we call proxemics. It's a type of communication theory. Um, and so proxemics tells us about the influence of visibility on communication. And this research was developed by Edward T. Hall, this theory, I should say, uh, back in the 1960s. He was an archaeologist, actually worked in the Guyana area uh, before he turned to this work. And this is, measures the distance between people in particular types of social context and interaction. <clears throat> so we can look at how near or far one needs to be to really take in the message that somebody's communicating from communicator to set to receiver. Um, and Paul distinguished between intimate space, personal space, social space, and public space. And as you can see here from the top, here's, say, uh, 
the person, the, the receiver, or sorry, the, the sender. And then um, we can see these people in the distance. Um, and basically as further away you get, of course, you're gonna lose the clarity of, of hearing or seeing or feeling uh, different types of ways of communicating, okay? So the types of data that I look at, um, I've looked at, like I said, uh, sandals, and I was fortunate enough to go to 18 different museums and curation facilities, including Arizona State Museum. While I was doing my research for my dissertation, um, I looked at over 300 twine sandals, um, and this was funded by a National Science Foundation uh, grant. And um, if you see the four corners here, uh, this distribution of these types of sandals is really concentrated in this big area. There's a few that show up at sites kind of uh, hither and yar, but the, these primarily show up in this general area. Then I also looked at sandal murals, uh, basically depictions of sandals um, on the inside of structures, usually kivas or other or habitations. Um, and I was able to take tree ring samples um, uh, from those structures to help me date uh, when those structures were built and then by um, extension when those murals must have been created. Uh, and you see a great example here of a cross section of a kiva that in the uh, uh, plaster surface on the inside wall, there were a number of inside sandal and other types of textile designs. And then the last type of um, uh, data that I collected uh, was uh, imagery, um, uh, information on imagery of sandal uh, depictions. And you can see there's quite a few of these, um, especially in the Bears Ears area, southeastern Utah, but then also a big cluster in Chaco Canyon. And my crews here volunteer uh, volunteer crews, or you can see documenting one of these sandal rock art panels here. So let's jump into it. So if we wanted to look at the proxemics of sandals, basically I wanted to understand what was the most appropriate or ideal context in which to view these things, um, particularly different aspects. Now, of course, when you wear a sandal, you cover most of it up with your foot. Um, so that in itself would probably be conducive to being more of um, a, a close-knit type of situation. Now, based on thresholds established by Brenda uh, Bowser back in 2002, um, she er, showed that um, symbols and line work on any type of artifact um, that was uh, basically needed to be between one and three inches uh, in size to be visible at the public near distance, which is basically about three and a half meters, so just over six feet. Um, now, when I looked at uh, twine sandal attributes, you can see the scale down here, two centimeters. You can see that most of these attributes are smaller than an inch, right? And so that suggested based on that most of the decorative motifs uh, were really most appropriate to be viewed within that public near distance. So I said, like I said, within about uh, just over six feet. Now the shapes and the general colors are much larger than that. So those could have been viewed at a larger distance and further away. Now, if we look then and compare that to the um, general performance spaces uh, that were available to folks in the Chaco and post-Chaco eras, um, we can see that there's a number of different places that are regularly seen as uh, spaces where performances or, or uh, ceremonies or interactions could have taken place. So we have small kivas up here, right here, and I've taken the liberty to put some folks about generally five-ish feet tall, a little smaller than me um, in here for, for scale. You can see small keys are pretty small, right? So if you're sitting on against one wall and you look out, there's not a whole lot of space to move around, but everything you see is gonna be in pretty close uh, confines. Now, court kivas are the next largest uh, structure that uh, we think was a uh, gathering communally. Uh, these are really at the center of, of most Chaco great houses. And I'll show you some examples of some in a bit. You can see if you're sitting on one bench, you can see across uh, the kiva um, and see what's going on. Now, most of us think of great kivas, particularly circular great kivas like this one here. This is uh, Casa Rinconada when it was being excavated. And you can see um, uh, Hewitt and some other folks sitting on these benches, and you can see what a large space that is, right? Uh, but if you're trying to look at where sandals could have been viewed, there's all these things in the way. 
right? So you can see here this person looking across these red areas are where you couldn't really see very well. Um, and really that's a much larger space than this six, six plus feet uh, where sandals would have been most appropriately viewed. Same with the rectangular great kivas of CMP3. Uh, performance is really geared towards looking up at these different stage levels. Really, this is kind of the first stadium seating in the Southwest. Um, now, interestingly, roads really fall into this uh, similar category here. You can see these are all to the same scale. So here you can see um, this is a uh, cross section uh, from the Whiskers Road, which is a pretty well known um, set of uh, road networks up in southeastern Utah, and folks sitting um, basically on either berm looking at activities in the center. You can see quite a bit. So what I did is basically calculated both the floor area, but then also the distance across these spaces from a number of different structures of, of documented from across the region. Um, and what we can see is that most of these uh, spaces in small kivas and court kivas, in particular, if you look at the radius, basically halfway across, so if you're sitting on the edge of that structure and you're looking towards the center, what would you be most uh, appropriate, the, the space you'd be able to see in? Um, um, we can see that this space where twine sandals are most ideally viewed uh, would be in court kivas and small kivas. Again, even without all those floor features getting in the way, if you're sitting around the edge, um, great kivas are much larger in size in terms of uh, the floor area and, and uh, distance across, either halfway or all the way. Um, so really those probably aren't the best places to view these sandals. Um, and then, so like I said, core kivas are really kind of the, the, the sweet spot for that. Um, and if we compare that to Chaco and Rhodes, um, mid-size kind of generalized Chaco and Rhodes are actually pretty equivalent in terms of their the, the, the distance across from the from either edge or from the center um, as core kivas. And you can see here, so core kivas, the, the uh, medium diameter, I should say the width, um, is uh, 6.4 meters, uh, which is and basically half of that is the ideal space to see those sandals being used. There's not a lot of feature, floor features in the way. Um, and then if we look at Chaco and Rhodes, really this falls within the same category here. So the radius to look to the center is about four to six um, uh, meters. Um, and um, really that's where, again, the, the sandals would have been the most ideal to be viewed. Um, so this really helps us to understand that Chaco and Rhodes weren't just these these linear um, features that connected settlements, so say Chetro Kettle or Pueblo Benito right in Chaco Canyon, and then all the activities going on in here, but actually these are actually linear performance spaces where people could have come from outlying communities to gather along the edges of roads to watch, say, processions or um, uh, other types of activities moving along these spaces. So let's switch then to looking at the rock art depictions and talk about those. Um, so I was able to, as part of my research, um, and this is, you know, I'm always collecting more data. So if you ever uh, come across some sandal imagery, I'd love to know about it. Um, but I was able to collect data on 520 different sandal depictions at about 130 sites. Um, and most of these are from Chaco Canyon or from the Bears Ears area. <clears throat> They come in a variety of forms from uh, solid, just pecked outlines to um, solid pecked. So basically, the interior is also pecked. Um, sometimes they're painted different colors. They can be drawn. This one's with charcoal. This one was abraded with probably a piece of sandstone against a sandstone cliff face. Um, or they could be incised or even really faintly scratched. I know that's hard to see, but that's about as good as it gets unless you um, uh, do a lot of photo enhancement. Um, so they come in a variety of different forms. The most common are the, the pecked varieties. Um, now these, uh, especially in southeastern Utah, along a road network that's been, uh, it was a, uh, defined initially by Winston Hurst uh, uh, and then also by Jonathan Till. This is an older map and there's been a number of new segments that have been uh, identified. Um, but as you're walking along these segments, and this is where I've done most of my research, um, often you'll come, especially when you're crossing Comb Ridge, this big sandstone monocline, you'll get to these hand toehold trails. And actually just out of view here, there was uh, just couldn't get the light to see it. There's big, big steps 
more like big, you know, steps we'd recognize that we'd want to walk on. And as you go up over this particular rise, uh, you come into a small valley, and off to the head of that valley is this large panel. This is a well-known procession panel. Now, most times when you see pictures of this, it's just looking straight on. And this is an incredible panel dating probably to the Basimigur III or early Pueblo I period, and has other components that are probably earlier in this area. But if you look to the right edge, you'll see these sandal depictions. And actually, there's a few more heading off to the, to the right. Um, so this, and this is a fairly typical type of scenario, particularly in southeastern Utah, and I think throughout the much, the, the greater uh, San Juan River Basin, uh, if we start to look hard enough. Uh, this is another example here, um, where a um, uh, road segment, well, let me show you these maps first. So this is uh, southeastern Utah here, the San Juan River, the Colorado. You can see these yellow dots are all the sandal rock art depictions. Um, the blue dots are the mural depictions. Um, if we look at this next map over, the same map, we can see these are the known um, uh, and documented road segments. And then the white dots are the, the great houses or great kivas here. And if we overlap those, we can see how closely these articulate. So uh, in many places, you can see where the, the black lines, the known roads, uh, interface with these yellow dots or blue dots, which are the sandal imagery. And then there's actually the, the red lines are these new road segments that we've been defining. This particular one down here is right up here. So as you're walking either up or down canyon, you get to this, uh, you're walking down and you get to this edge of this rim, you go down this little ramp, is covered in rock art. This is a very extensive rock art panel here. Um, and right at the base, right at the base of this ramp, um, there are a number of sandal depictions. So here's some nice spirals uh, next to one of these sandals. Here's another paired set of sandals, some smaller versions, and then some other sandals going up this way as if to show you to go up there. Um, and this is just one, this is just another example. Like I said, these are pretty common out in southeastern Utah. Now, to look at these in terms of their performance characteristics, um, some sandal depictions show up, like I said, in small structures, right? And those would be private settings, again, within that public near space. But most sandal depictions along roads are actually in more public spaces. Uh, so you can see here's a great example uh, where you're walking up this road network over Comb Ridge and you come across this, this rather large rock art panel and you can see these solid pecked sandals from a good distance away. You also pack a fair number of people in that space if one needed to in ancient times. So this is again a public setting. It's not like these are hidden away, tucked away so you can't see them. These are meant to be seen, road signs. Um, and here's a close up of that. Um, this is an example Jonathan Till talks about in his master's thesis, where we actually have people walking along or he thinks coming up over um, a road here. And this is pretty typical and actually pretty similar to the procession panel in many ways, where we have these earlier elements like flute players um, from the Bassmaker III period, um, people walking in rows or along a line, um, and then the more recent um, Chaco era sandals. So I want to give you a few, I'll show you a few other examples here. Now, this is the earliest um, uh, versions that I know of that have been documented today from near the Guadalupe Great House in the very southeast corner of the Chacoan world. Um, and actually, it's not even on, in the San Juan drainage, from what I understand. Um, and um, it has several components, uh, the earliest of which... Uh, dates about 918, and that's based on some tree ring dates here. You can see these beautiful depictions here. These look a little different, a little unusual. Um, and But if we compare them to sandals from the same time period, you can see how closely they match. And now this particular sandal, this is the top and the bottom. This comes from Antelope House, um, uh, but on the very other side of the, the Southwest. But uh, uh, these sandals were, were made and used throughout the, the region at the time. We can see how closely the toe, this deeply scalloped toe, shows up. Um, really true to form. Um, and then on the lower surface, at this point in time, uh, they had these raised tread designs isolated just to the lower third of the sandal. Um, and this shows up as well. The proportion's a little bit different. You can see 
It's a little hard to make out these race tread geometrics. They're actually trying to execute that as well. So really, really true to form um, and uh, shows that this particular uh, image was probably made right at the beginning of that Chacoan occupation, the construction in the, in the 900s. Basically by the 10 hundreds, we see a major change in the shape. I'll talk about that in a sec. Now, most sandal imagery though, um, is a little bit different. Um, and it has this contoured toe with this little jog right here. You can see uh, at the very Northwest corner of the Chaco system, um, way up here, uh, and these are actually buried now by the Lake Powell, um, these two sites. Now this one right here, Smith Fork Bar actually has the largest concentration of sandal imagery. I think there's like at least 42 different depictions. And most of those again, have these contoured toe shapes. So a little bit different looking. Now, if we go to the Chaco Canyon itself on the very other extreme of the basin, we can see near Casa Chiquita, and then also at Pueblo Benito, this same type of contoured toe with the toe jog, right? So this is 185 miles as the crow flies, um, but it's, this is really important because it tells us across this huge basin, this large space on this incredibly um, uh, well-populated uh, social landscape, people were talking about the same things at the very far extremes of the Chaco world. Um, these meant similar things. So let's talk a little more about that. Um, just to give you a few more examples from other Chaco and great houses. Um, in the other extreme, their um, uh, petrolhead forest, my friend Max Thornton, let me borrow this image here of these two paired sandals, um, again, with the contoured toe with the toe jog. Whirlwind House right below the Chuska Mountains near uh, Tohatchi. Uh, my friend Walkie told him to use this image. It was taken in the 70s, so he scanned it. It's a little hard to see. I enhanced it a bit here. So you can see that there's actually at least 35 different sandal depictions uh, with that contoured toe. Um, from this site that was uh, built and constructed in the between 100, uh, excuse me, 1000 and 1100. Now, if we go to Chaco Canyon itself, sandal imagery is actually really common. Uh, and there's, uh, you can see all of these different great houses uh, that have sandal imagery either in them or nearby. Uh, and then other great houses around the basin where I've been able to document sandal imagery really clearly. There's probably a lot more, um, but this is uh, yet to be uh, this particular area has been uh, really yet to be studied this way. So inside Pueblo Benito in room 33, there's this beautiful pair of mismatched sandals, again, with the toe jog and the contoured toe. Um, the only painted version I know of in a mural comes from Pueblo del Arroyo here um, in room 44. And then uh, Chetro Kettle as well. So right in the heart of downtown Chaco has all these different incised sandal depictions. Now, if we look at those um, more closely, and this is one, another one from Pueblo Benito, we can see that not only do these sandals um, have shapes that we can recognize, but then they also have design elements that are really reminiscent or, or pretty clo uh, close to, to matching the actual tread designs on these other sandals. You can see here what we call the dripping line motif shows up on this sandal from southeastern Utah that dates to the um, uh, early to mid 10 hundreds, um, and then this other one from Pueblo Benito itself that also dates to around that same time period. So people aren't just drawing some type of sandal that comes to their mind, they're drawing specific things they probably saw um, and maybe even that they wore. Above Wajiji, um, there's this uh, nice paired set here. And then, like I said, at Casa Chiquita, there's this other uh, example with the jog toe. Now, when we look at these, um, there's a number of different types of sandals people used uh, in at this time frame. Uh, so how do we know which types they're actually drawing, right? Um, well, there's a bunch of these are basically the different varieties of sandals that people had in the northern southwest in the Chaco and post Chaco era. But most likely, I think they're probably showing these twine sandals. Um, and I'll talk about why in a sec. So first of all, they have these toe jogs, and I'll talk more about what those might be in a sec. Um, uh, the actual sandals have these toe jogs, and then the depictions, both rock art and building murals often have them, but they're showed up as these little line work off the edge, kind of stylized, but clearly showing uh, that particular feature. Now, I should say as a caveat that there are uh, some fine twill plated sandals that also have these same shapes, um, but I think they probably date within the same uh, construct that I'll talk about in a sec. We look at murals, we see that again, not only are sandals being depicted um, 
but with they're being depicted with great great resolution in terms of the actual tread designs and other attributes so this is a, a depiction these are some inside sandals from a, a structure in natural bridges national monument this mismatched pair that i've traced the the photo um and then another sandal that i was able to look at that comes from grand gulch about a dozen or so miles away actually not only um has the similar treads, but this is a, probably about as close of a comparison as you could get uh, in terms of actually trying to scratch this into plaster. If we look at rock art, we can see similar uh, types of um, uh, equivalents. So this is a, an abraded um, uh, panel from Grand Gulch here. Again, I've traced the photo and you can see how closely that matches this sandal from Aztec West. Um, this also provides us a way to date some of this rock art. And rock art is routinely very, very difficult to date, but in this case, and in this case, I was able to, this going back to this one, I was able to get tree ring samples from this structure and know that this particular set of murals was made after 1216, before about 1250. Um, this particular sandal here dates between 1215 and 1266. So not only are they similar, they date to the same time frame, And the same here with this example from Aztec. Now, most of these um, sandals uh, from the Chaco post-Chaco era, um, these twine sandals, these are the most complex types of textiles ever produced in the Southwest. Weavers and archeologists agree. Um, they were made from really finely processed yucca yarns. No two pair were exactly alike. You can see a pair here. Um, uh, and, but left to right, they were mirror images of each other. Uh, they have contoured toes, often with these toe jogs, and they often have both colored and raised tread designs. And these raised treads would have left really uh, striking um, marks in soft soil. They also have a long history of being produced from the Bassmaker II period through the Pueblo III period. And even though the shapes of the toes and the heel construction changed a bit, and some of the color designs, they really changed very little over this long span of time. <clears throat> the sandals I documented come from across the region, but particularly from great houses. Um, and there seems to be a really strong association, association in the Chaco and post Chaco era between um, twine sandals and great houses. Uh, so there's different ways we can date them, either with AMS dating here. I was able to get uh, permission to take samples from 32 different sandals to date them. Um, but then also we can look at the context where they're recovered from. So because we have tree ring dating um, and Aztec West in particular has been really well dated, we know when these different sectors of the building were constructed. And then most often the objects within those rooms don't usually predate the construction of the actual room itself. At least that's when it was used. Um, now, like I said, most during the Chaco era, most uh, twine sandals seem to be associated with great houses. Um, now there's uh, four, uh, great houses in Chaco Canyon that have quite a few of them, and then four outside of the canyon. And there's probably many more, but just they haven't been recovered or the preservation techniques aren't as good. Um, in terms of the recovery context in the Chaco era, most of this twine sandals, you can see these rooms where the highlighted come from rooms that are connected through a series of doorways to court kivas that open up right on these court kivas. Again, those are those really ideal settings in which you'd be able to view them. Um, in the post Chaco era, their uh, sandals are often recovered from either small kivas, rooms associated with small kivas, or their imagery appears in small, uh, small kivas. So there's that connection with those really ideal spaces to view them. So these results show us that um, Twine sandals were stored in rooms very near where they were probably used and tells us probably who owned them, uh, what groups, groups that um, owned and used court kivas and small kivas. Um, and they were probably associated with, with the folks that, that um, use these structures and then they probably stored in particular rooms um, off of off the, the, the courtyard above the kiva itself. In terms of the toe jogs, these are a really fascinating attribute. So um, about 10 years ago, Patty Crown from UNM and some of her colleagues um, uh, wrote an article called Footnotes, really a uh, good play on words, I thought. Um, but they suggest that sandal imagery and foot imagery are really important symbols at Chaco Canyon, and especially at Pueblo Benito. Um, they noted that several members of a really important lineage 
um, in the northern burial cluster of Pueblo Benito um, had a condition called polydactyly. They lived about 850 AD. And polydactyly is a genetic condition where you have an extra digit or two on your foot, sometimes on your hand. This is passed down through, um, through, the, uh, through your, your children. Um, and they suggested that these toe jogs in the lateral side of the sandal were basically symbolic connection, symbolic six toes uh, on the edge of the sandals. Not everybody had six toes, but by wearing a sandal with a toe jog, you could connect with these ancestors, whether they are real ancestors or fictive ancestors um, that were the folks that founded both Pueblo Benito and by extension, the Chaco system. You could connect with that past. I was able to um, run my MS dates through some Bayesian modeling in the program called OxCal to really narrow down when that attribute uh, was made. Uh, so we can see all the different dates here. Basically what that does is it takes your big ranges of radiocarbon dates and narrows those down statistically. Um, and what that showed us, there's a kind of summary of that, is that toe jogs began, didn't really begin till the mid 10 hundreds. Um, and that they kept being used until the late 1200s. So in terms of uh, Dr. Crown's work, suggesting that the polydactyly um, and the toe jogs were meant as a citation to these founding ancestors, it didn't actually start and become come into fashion until about 200 or so uh, years later. So it was potentially then a citation to these distant ancestors. So um, what this equates though, is when we look at sandal imagery uh, along roads or other places, uh, if we see these contoured sh shapes and toe jogs, they must post-date the mid 10 hundreds. Another important attribute of the heel finishes, the, the, the bottom of the heel, the last thing you weave. Now, um, I looked when I looked at the sandals, there were really only four different styles made um, throughout the, the region over time. Um, and the most common uh, from the Aztec area, the middle San Juan, um, was this variety here called plain weft twining. Now, most of the examples I found were, were from that site, but then there was a, a scattering of a few other examples across the region here, just in small numbers though. Now, at the same time, uh, another production center of these sandals was Antelope House in Canyon de Chez. Uh, and they had two different styles of heel finish, but they were uh, very distinct, if you knew what to look for, from the style at Aztec West. And again, the concentration of those was at Antelope House with a few examples in these outlying areas, showing us the movement of the sandals either after they are worn um, uh, or as they were um, uh, traded uh, from these centers of production. We see these kind of competing networks, if you will. Now, the last uh, major attribute I'm gonna tell you about is the raised tread designs. And these are really my favorite. So uh, as these were woven, the twining process, you have two strands, two wefts. You take one and wrap it around the other a certain way. And as you squish that textile together, pound it down to finish it, and it pushes those knots, if you will, to the bottom surface, not to the top. And it creates these, you can make these geometric designs. Uh, so for example, this, this is this one of these interlocking scrolls here from Aztec West. Now, when I talk to Louis and Chris about these, um, uh, Louis suggested, again, I'll, I'll read you his quote, that the tread seemed to be a really important attribute of twine sandals. The design left unique footprints and could have been an indicator of a specific village or clan territory or to identify an individual from their tracks. And as we look at the data and I displayed it, uh, calculated the data, we can see that certain communities across the region had a really strong preference for certain raised tread designs. So in um, the middle San Juan where Aztec West is, there's a clear preference for what I call the isolated shaped design. Um, and then in southeastern Utah, there's a clear preference for these diagonal oriented, really thick tread designs. Um, and then in Canyon de Chez, there's a strong preference for these grids or uh, um, uh, rows and columns of dots or bars. And as we, if we look at the radiocarbon dates, particularly of these uh, isolated shapes, uh, I was able to get four dates, uh, sandals from, sorry, dates from four sandals with that shape. We can see they're also made within a very small, uh, uh, pretty narrow time frame. also. Um, this tells us these were, um, 
multi-generational, but within a fairly uh, confined space. So in a very real sense, as you walked across the landscape and saw where people had used these sandals and, and walked um, through the landscape, you would be able to tell not only who they were, but where they came from. These are really important stamps of identities along the way. Now, we also looked at use wear, and most of these sandals, um, so there's a few that are only slightly worn, but most of them have really um, deep holes, big holes in the heel, sometimes the ball of the foot and the tip of the toe. Um, and uh, this is really the most common, the moderate to heavy wear. A few of them are totally what we call exhausted by our modern sensibilities. We would have probably thrown these out long ago, but they kept wearing them. Um, in a few cases, they patch uh, twine sandals with either pieces of leather or sometimes kind of haphazardly with old pieces of other twine sandals, um, basically to get them probably through their last use. And what this suggests is that twine sandal owners may have only received one pair in their whole life and they kept wearing them until, until the end, until they couldn't wear them any longer for whatever reason. Um, but it also tells us the type of wear, the type of activities they were undertaking. In this case, um, most likely walking across rough terrain or potentially dancing. Now, I don't have time to go into it, but because of this particular wear, it does not look like these are running shoes. And I know that's been a pretty common interpretation of Chaco and Rhodes is that they have racetracks, that's still a possibility. They just weren't wearing these particular shoes while they were doing that. Now, as I showed these to Louis and Chris, the weavers, they had, really were excited about this discussion, basically looking at the use wear. Um, so Louis added that textiles are a really important part of a Pueblo person's milestones in life. An individual is often gifted with articles of clothing and footwear as part of rites of passage, like marriage or other types of, of things. Um, and he added that garments are worn during special events as long as a wearer is able to extend and maintain their use. And then Chris added that, um, and this is something I think is really, really poignant, that sandals were a deeply personal item. Once they're made, they belong solely to an individual. And they were likely not shared or passed on. And he added that, um, at least for um, in historic times, after a person uh, passes away, their, their shoes are, are uh, discarded. You never pass them on to another person. They don't, it's, that wouldn't be appropriate. Um, and so I think that's really important to think about this in terms of the bigger picture then. So uh, if we put all this together, we can see that in certain places, like this is an example from Aztec West here, where we have some sandals, in this case, 27, that have this isolated shape design. Uh, and then we have a few of similar ones scattered across the landscape. Um, we can think about Chaco and Roads in terms of being the vehicles and the venues through which these, um, these sandals were moved across the landscape. Uh, probably not just traded, but actually walked across these roads. Now, Chocolate roads aren't paved. They're, they remain dirt. And so they would have been really ideal for leaving footprints with these particular types of footwear. One last thing to think about is um, the interpretation of ritual umbilicals. Again, these time bridges. Uh, now, several of the examples I've showed you uh, to speak to the this connection to ancestral uh, spaces here, particularly the procession panel is probably the best example. We have this uh, Basket Maker 3 uh, portion of the panel, Basket Maker 3 or Pueblo 1 with all the processions here of people. And then these citations with later sandals. And we know these are later because again, the toe shape, right? So this is a way you would uh, commemorate, connect with, reenact, reinvigorate these connections with your ancestors. Um, by walking uh, by by walking through these landscapes uh, and leaving your mark. At the same time, and in a similar way, uh, people wore twine sandals and they wore them with these different attributes, uh, either with toe jogs to commemorate, to cite these ancestors with polydactyly who themselves uh, were wearing sandals shaped like this. Uh, this is a way to connect with the past, these bridges, both in rock arts and with actual perishable uh, textiles to connect with ancestors and identities in the past. So to conclude, um, I know I've talked a lot about a lot of things here, but Chaco roads were 
probably linear performance spaces that moved across the landscape. They weren't just these static things to connect places. Uh, there were places where uh, actions were performed and reperformed, identities were created and reproduced. Um, sandal imagery was really common across the Chaco world and particularly associated with uh, the Chaco roads and great houses. Sandal imagery along roads was situated often at junctions or changes in topography, and they acted as road signs showing pilgrims, migrants, um, uh, and people moving across the landscape the way to go. They functioned, again, as citations of the past within the context of their present. Um, so I think this approach to look for these types of road signs, if you will, um, and walking shoes is, is really um, an appropriate way to use and combine um, with the new technology of LIDAR and other types of ground toothing um, to identify new road segments. Uh, and then similarly, you know, uh, some twine sandal attributes changed over time, and then some change the same. Again, they're referencing the past uh, while also speaking to the present. And importantly, they were owned by individuals. And this is something we really have a hard time getting at in the archaeological record, the individual in the past. Now there's a lot of big data happening uh, throughout the Southwest, big studies that combine uh, ceramics and, and rock art and lithics and stuff from across the region, which is really, really important and phenomenal. We also have to remember not to lose track of those specific people, the people in the past who did these things, um, and then their descendants who live here still today. So with that, i am leave you and um, open it up for questions. Thank you. Any questions? No. Oh. Thank you, Ben. Um, first, we're going to take questions from the audience here locally, and then I will uh, track a few questions on Zoom. Um, if you have a question, please let raise your hand, and I'll bring the microphone to you. Any questions here? I'm I'm just wondering if you have any evidence that the coarser sandals might have been made by and used by people of less wealth or status? That's a great question. Uh, I didn't have time to get into that. Um, yes. And actually, let's see if I, I always keep a few extra slides in here to kind of talk about that type of thing. If I can find them. Yeah, let's see. Um, yeah. So twine sandals were the most complex textile Produced in the Southwest. Shoot, I'm not finding it. Um, but there were other types of sandals also made. Let's see, right here we go. Um, no, that's not it. Sorry, one sec. Yeah, there we go. Um, so this is uh, Louis uh, Garcia and I put this together um, based on our conversations. Um, and uh, there are, so like I said, there's a number of other types of sandals used contemporaneously as these twine sandals. Some are very easy to make. These are with made with minimally processed uh, fine, uh, narrow leaf yucca leaves. And I've replicated one of these in about 25 minutes. If I started doing it regularly, I could probably do it in about 10 minutes. Um, and these are very common, much more common, um, or I should say, these easier to make varieties than the twine sandals. Um, there's other types of wicker work, these twill plated uh, sandals, the coarse ones, again, minimally processed yucca leaves. A friend of mine showed me how to make these, a uh, lady named Mary Wiaki, who's doing a lot of replication work, um, and she can whip one of these out, again, in like 15, 20 minutes. Um, and again, these are much more common than these twine sandals. Nobody has recently has been able to replicate them. There's one lady I know of who um, isn't with us, and unfortunately, anymore, but she was able to figure it out. Um, and it took, it took her, I think, about a week to make each one. And Louis and Chris really, really want to try to make some of these. The thing is, each one has over 110 feet of string in it. So you make the string, dye certain stuff, and then you have to weave it. Um, so it really takes a master. And then what they pointed out when looking at these is not only do you make one, then you have to make the matched mate to it. And that's when you know a really sophisticated, advanced weaver. Um, this one lady who, who was able to do this, uh, like I said, uh, about a decade or two decades ago, probably now, um, she, she has a great video out and she, she said that, you know, the first one she made was this big and then the next one was made was like this big. 
Um, but like I said, these are really strongly associated with Chaco and great houses in the, in the Chaco era. Um, and we do see these same types of sandals, these other types at those same sites. Um, but because of the complexity of the structure and the labor effort that went into them, the general thought amongst archaeologists and the weavers I've talked to is these are probably specialists who produce them and that they would have gained a lot of prestige from doing that. Um, so it probably wasn't everybody who had them or was able to wear them. Um, and then size, I didn't have time to go on that, but the size of these sandals also shows that they were for adults. And so they weren't just for kids running around in the Chaco era. Um, they're primarily for adults and probably for um, uh, leaders or people of pre uh, uh, prestige. But yeah. Other questions from the audience here? I think that all of the sandals that you've talked about were uh, oriented from yucca leaf. Any anything leather that you come across? That's a great question. Um, there are a few leather sandals, and and would we find the same type of difference that was talked about earlier in class? Um, that's a great question. So, because leather um, leather is not as conducive to preserve, right? Critters like to eat leather, um, bugs and insects, I mean, the, the, the bugs and, and mice and other types of things like to eat leather. So often we find just scraps of leather. Um, yucca, not too much, many things like to eat yucca fibers because they're really tough and coarse. So there's a preservation bias for one. Um, but as far as we can tell, leather footwear in the Pueblo world, was very uncommon until 1300. And I usually put a slide in here, I didn't have it here tonight, but um, basically from about 8,000 BC to 1300 AD, the preferred material to make footwear in the four corners was yucca. Um, and then after 1300, yucca sandals totally fall out of use and leather takes over. Um, and so at least in the proto, what we call the proto-historic or in the, in the modern era, um, there are certain types of moccasins that are fancier than others. Uh, Louis was telling me about um, certain ones that have certain uh, tall leggings attached and things like that, but generally speaking, they're pretty similar. Uh, so it seems like after 1300, there's this somewhat intentional stepping away from the hierarchy that's expressed with footwear, uh, which is part and parcel that we see in all sorts of other types of material culture, where there seems to be a stepping away from the visible um, uh, uh, differentiation in social status. Any other questions from the audience? Uh, before I jump on to the Zoom ones, Ben, I actually have a question for you. Sure. Um, you talked about the specialists that probably would have uh, uh, been producing um, more of the, the ornate uh, mm -hmm. wine. And then you also mentioned a trade network before. Is there, how do we distinguish or can you um, look at how if sandals were so such an individualized item, um, were they part of a trade network or would they have been something that would have been produced within someone's uh, community? Great question. So it's it's difficult to get at that. Um, but some of the things like those heel finishes, there's kind of the, I think the, one of the keys to looking at that combined with the more visible traits. So um, looking at those heel finishes, we can see that there is only a few, um, a few options that people used. Let me go back to that real quick. Right there. Um, so I looked at over 300 sandals um, and about 280 of those, I'd say, from, from the Chaco era. Of course, you couldn't see, sometimes they're worn off, but when I could see the heel finish, there, like I said, there were of that huge number, 284, there was only four versions of the heel finish, four different ways that people did it. So that suggests that not anybody could just try it out. There was There was one, it was specialized knowledge, it was probably passed down, but also there wasn't a lot of social leeway for innovation, right? It was very prescribed ways that you did these things. Um, so, you know, looking at this figure here, um, the largest concentrations of each one of those sets of heel finishes is at, is at certain places. 
And the, the common way to interpret that would be uh, there's a community specialization, right? And maybe within that, there might've been individual guilds or, you know, groups. Um, it can't really get beyond that, but site level is still pretty good. And then they were either traded out or people walked them out. Um, another option would be that the weavers, some of the weavers might've moved and joined these other communities. If that would happen, one might expect there to be more innovation. So when copying errors occur and people try new things when they're kind of away from the social pressures, but again, we really don't see that. Um, so um, what what I've interpreted that as is that there's there's these producing communities and there's probably other com producing commun community, bleh, sorry, specialized uh, community producers. Um, and there's like this other, uh, this fourth one here is really, he'll finish his comment up in this area, but we just don't have the resolution uh, yet to kind of be able to distinguish that. Uh, but that's a really good question. and something I hope to uh, pursue uh, down the road. One, I've talked with folks about potentially doing some isotopic studies uh, to see where the yucca grew and if you could isolate that and then compare that to the, the woven structures. But the which is a possibility. The problem is you need a lot of comparative samples from across the area. There's a lot of yucca that grows in a lot of places. And um, because yucca, it's not like trees where it puts down a deep tap root and sucks up the water from really down low. It's got pretty shallow roots show and it grows in alluvial like windblown sediments. So you'd probably get kind of a blurry signature at best, but it's something I definitely would like to pursue down the road. Thanks. Thank you. That's really interesting. Okay, I'm going to address some of the uh, questions that we have on the Zoom uh, chat. Uh, we've got quite a few, so I'm going to try to um, pick the ones that resonate uh, across okay. the other questions. Um, one question was, uh, they were talking about LIDAR or thermal analysis, uh, density of soil compactness to determine if the sandals on the roads or to determine the sandals on the road or that say the common direction of travel. I'm not sure I got that one. I don't think, if I understand parts of that question anyway, um, I I don't think the, the footprints would last uh, on windblown sands that would have covered these roads. And I think that's also partially the point. Um, they aren't meant to last. They're meant to be seen in the action, um, but then, you know, it's it's similar to the way um, uh, masonry structures are preserved by the federal government and and Pueblo people say, you know, some some of those need to go back. They need to they need to fall apart. Things are meant to go back to the earth. Um, you know, a prayer isn't necessarily something that lasts forever. It's meant to be done made in a certain context and place and time, um, and then it goes off to where it's supposed to go. And I think the footprints leaving those may have been a prayer or some type of commemoration in that same way. Um, another question. In your slides, the latest dates of context with sandals are around 1300. Did people stop using sandals at that point? Yes. Again, I'm bummed I didn't put that slide in here tonight. Uh, I took it out for time. But but yeah, like I said, um, between from about um, 8,000 or so BC, until 1300 AD in the Four Corners, yucca sandals were the norm. Um, and then after that, after about 1300, 1350 at the very latest, there's one variety, excuse me, that um, from the Salado culture um, that goes to about 1350-ish. But after that, basically uh, yucca sandals stopped being produced. And then there's a across the board switch to leather moccasins. And that continues up until uh, the very recent. All right. Um, you mentioned uh, one interpretation of Chaco and Rhodes is that they were racetracks, but that the sandal wear patterns suggest that they were not used for running. Can you relate your sandal studies and conclusions to some of the non-Chaco linear features that have been interpreted as racetracks? Well, you know, I am not an expert on racetracks. Um, there are folks like Rob Weiner, uh, that she just finished his dissertation looking at Chalker Roads. He's a, definitely an expert, I'd say. You might want to direct that question to him. I know he's looked a lot at that. Um, but with the research I've done and talking with the descendant communities, um, 
racing has still been a very important thing in Pueblo society. Um, there's some great examples. I've seen pictures of uh, some Zuni leaders in the early 1900s who participated in community races. Um, and in those particular races, uh, they often use what we call kick sticks. And it's basically a, this little stick about yay big that you'd pick up with your toe and toss down the trail. Um, it's a way to kind of keep you honest, but also it makes it harder, I think. Um, and so these runners run up, pick up the stick, throw it, and they get really adept at this. Um, but they do it barefoot. And so there's this whole world of using Chaco and roads and, and running races that is... I'm not able to address with this because based on the um, uh, the wear patterns, um, looking at the biomechanics of that, um, we don't, it doesn't look like these particular types of footwear were used for running. And so that's, that's really all I can say on that. Great. Well, another kind of on that note, you mentioned how an individual might have one pair of sandals throughout their life that they would then mend as necessary. Is there any indication that children or adolescents wore sandals? I know you mentioned that they may not be. And, or would people have received or made their footwear at a certain age? That's a great question. Um, so in, in looking at the size of these twine sandals in the Chaco era, they're all within and across the region. It's really interesting how uniform in terms of the lengths they are. It's plus or minus two centimeters off of 26 centimeters. Um, and that's several centimeters on average larger than all of the other types of sandals. Um, so at least in this time period, these sandals, it looks like were made for adults and maybe just for men. Um, but there, the other types of sandals do come in a variety of sizes. And I should say in the Bassmaker 3 period, even the twine sandals came in a variety of sizes that would be suitable for kids, sub-adults, and adults. Um, so this is, it's... So I'm not saying that nobody else wore any types of sandals. Um, but then also when you look at the, um, uh, Louis brought this up when we were doing our research. Um, when you look at depictions, say from the from Mesoamerica, uh, either in sculpture or frescoes or other types of um, uh, the codices, um, most people go barefoot most of the time. Uh, and it's really in those depictions, it's it's the leaders, it's the deities that wear shoes. Um, and But most people went barefoot most of the time. And in talking with Pueblo folks, we think that even with moccasins, most people probably went barefoot most of the time. I've seen pictures of um, from the late 1800s of a Tarahumara woman from northern Mexico carrying a big older lady, carrying a big bundle of firewood, walking barefoot through six inches deep of snow. Um, and so it, people probably had much tougher feet and their sensibilities were not as delicate as ours. So I think there's a lot of uh, room to, to, to work within that. But at this particular time in the Chaco post Chaco era, these sandals, I think, were just for adults and probably just um, uh, worn in particular special types of situations. Well, Ben, thank you very much. Um, I know there's a few more questions we could probably uh, get into, but you have given your time very graciously tonight. No and um, we really appreciate you and your research. And we look forward to hearing back on, on any of the future uh, research that you get to do, the, some of the things you were talking about, you're looking into. So thank you very much. Ben Bellarado, everyone. Thank you. Thank you very much. Have a good night. Thank you very much to our Zoom participants and have a great evening.